Okay, I'm Ron Squibbs, and I teach music theory at the University of Connecticut. And uh, so I'll be talking about a couple of things today with reference to metastases, especially to the uh, outer sections um, of the piece, about the outer sections of the piece. And uh, since what I normally teach is uh, harmony and form, I will be looking at the piece pretty much through that lens. <clears throat> Metastasis for orchestra was composed in 1953-54. The orchestra is dominated by a large string ensemble in which each player performs an independent part. It also features winds, brass, and percussion, which appear in some sections of the work but not in others. Metastasis is generally considered to be Zanakis' first mature composition. And the work exists in two versions, Metastasis A and Metastasis B. Metastasis B is a revised version with a string ensemble of 46 players, and that was published by Boozy and Hawks in 1967. Metastasis A, with a slightly larger string ensemble, I believe, um, has been performed recently in Europe, and it seems to be uh, about to be published. So my remarks today will be with reference to Metastasis B, which until recently was the standard and only available version of the work. As the composer remarks in his preface to the published score, the title of the work comes from the Greek meta, meaning after or beyond, and stasis, indicating stationary states. The combination of these two root words thus conveys the meaning of dialectical transformation. Metastasis thus represents a dynamic synthesis of elements that were especially pertinent to Xenakis at the time of its composition. Among the specifically musical antecedents to metastasis are Schoenberg's 12-tone approach to composition and Messiaen's modes of limited transposition. The role of Messiaen's modes in the genesis of the harmonies in metastasis has not been much discussed. It's one of the facets of the work that I will explore briefly today. Among the elements derived from drawing and architecture, of course, are applications of proportions to the work's temporal structure, and we have heard some discussion about this topic already. Also, um, the rendering of ruled surfaces into uh, sound is one of the, the features of metastasis. And finally, there are the composer's personal experiences in Greece in the 1940s, both as a student of engineering at uh, Athens Polytechnic and in his involvement in the Greek resistance against the Nazis and other occupying forces. It was this involvement, of course, that led to his emigration from Greece after nearly losing his life in a mortar attack. This is a graphic transcription of the string parts for the first 55 measures of metastasis. We saw actually a more elegant uh, transcription of this uh, multicolor in Benoit's uh, presentation this morning. What I want to point out about this um, is, in some respects, uh, repeating some things that Benoit said, that it begins uh, on a single pitch, G3, G below middle C, which on this graph is, um, is uh, at negative five, five semitones below zero. And then the, um, the glissandi spread out to form a 46-note cluster. And one of the features of this cluster that I wanted to point out was that it is really voiced as a chord. Uh, the, the pitches are more uh, closely spaced in the upper register, and they are somewhat more sparsely spaced in the lower register. And then there's a mysterious sort of gap of an octave in the middle. And that sounds like this. if I can get the cursor to behave. Here it is.
So from a musical standpoint, what is here that can be analyzed? Uh, from conventional approach even to uh, 20th century analysis, we have multiple representations of all 12 chromatic pitch classes. So in some respects, analytically, that might seem to be uh, you know, just too much information. But um, I thought I might look at the boundary pitches of this cluster and see what I might find there. So I started from the G, and I looked at the highest pitch, which is A sharp way up here, and then the lowest pitch, which of course is the lowest pitch available on the double basses, E1. And I also looked at the boundaries of that gap in the middle of the cluster. And once I did that, I began to uh, think about uh, associations, musical associations, of this particular collection of pitch classes. But one thing, I realized that potentially, if he had wanted to, Zanakis uh, could have made a symmetrical expansion from the G out to these other pitches. But instead, he took that idea a little bit farther and made it asymmetrical. Uh, but again, here we're getting a little bit closer to what perhaps is a, a harmonic point of origin for that enormous cluster, namely a diminished seventh chord. And that has all sorts of musical associations with uh, intense drama, um, going back to Bach, Beethoven, Liszt, etc. So we can hear this reduction. This uh, does involve MIDI instruments, so I apologize for the somewhat ridiculous sound of the glissandi here. <laughs> Here's the reduction of the center. And the diminished seventh chord. Now, of course, what fills in this space, this pitch space, is uh, multiple iterations of all 12 chromatic pitch classes in the actual cluster. And the idea of the 12 chromatic pitch classes appears on the surface of the music as a detail. This is something that I learned this time uh, through, through looking at metastasis, that when some of the string instruments drop out and they begin to play in pizzicati, they articulate, in this case, almost a 12-tone roll. We actually have one too many G sharps here and no G. Uh, but this type of gesture is repeated a little bit later on in the piece with an actual 12-tone 12, 12 row. <clears throat> so in this case, sort of the, the substance of the pitch class becomes surface detail. In this reduction, that sounds like this. This is not really a reduction, but rather an extraction of the pizzicati from the texture. <laughs> Okay, so obviously this is a transformation of at least some aspects of um, Schoenberg's 12-tone approach to composition. Here we have a uh, little bit of an analysis of the temporal structure of the first 55 measures of Nenistasis. <clears throat> a number of people have pointed out that there are 34 measures of Glissandi and then a uh, the sustained chord, which goes on for 21 measures. And clearly, of course, uh, 21, 34, 55 are all members of the Fibonacci series that were used uh, by Le Corbusier in uh, the construction of the modulor. But I looked a little bit further what was going on during the 21 measures of the sustained string glissando, and I found that um, the, the, the period of time that is spent on uh, just sustaining those notes without tremolo articulation is 13 measures, and then there are eight measures of tremolo. So again, we have the golden section via some integers from the Fibonacci series. And even within the non-tremolo section, there are eight measures that, are, that do not contain the pizzicati, and then there are five measures that contain the pizzicati that we just heard. So we really have a four-level structure here, all based on um, the uh, numbers from the Fibonacci series. And then, in this case, I did something a little bit unconventional. Instead of putting the woodblock where it exists in the score, uh, above the strings, as one would normally find in an orchestral score, put it on the bottom, and I saw that it was almost symmetrically um, situated within the 55 measures. And of course, the distances between the articulations of the woodblock are based mostly 
on uh, integers from the Fibonacci series. And of course, having made that graphic, I was reminded of uh, the, uh, the convent of La Tourette with these um, <clears throat> rectangular planes and then some thin columns supporting at least portions of the structure. With a little bit of imagination, it is possible to conceive of the first part of metastasis, the first 104 measures, as a single thematic process. And this is showing the, uh, the influence of the constant teaching of, of form that I go through. So perhaps there's a bit of mind warp uh, here um, in viewing things this way. But potentially, one could view the opening 34 measures of Glissandi as a basic idea, followed by a contrasting idea of the uh, sustained string cluster, and that, of course, is accompanied by the articulations of the woodblock, and that, therefore, the entire uh, 55 measures of the opening may be seen as perhaps a, an antecedent in some kind of thematic process. Then there is a little uh, link to the second section as the string mass drops out, and we hear the triangle and xylophone briefly until the strings come back in. When they do, they, in a sense, develop the rhythm of the woodblock by uh, changing their dynamics from very loud to very soft. So we get a, a development of the woodblock rhythm in the string section. On top of that, the brass enter to increase the sense of, of uh, tension and drama throughout this, this fragmentation um, section. And then we get <clears throat> another series of glissandi in the strings, this time leading to a four-note chord. And that functions perhaps something like a cadence. So let me just play that excerpt and give you an opportunity to experiment with the idea that this might be a single thematic process. to look a little bit at the uh, brass passage, just pulling that out as a detail for a moment. As I began to look at this more closely, I realized that there are some references to Messiaen's modes of limited transposition here. The beginning in the trombones references the fourth mode, giving a seven-note subset of it. There are eight notes in that mode. 
the center where the trumpets and the horns enter, combining with the trombones, present the sixth mode. And then at the end, there's a reversal of what the trombones are doing. Um, and again, we have a seven-note subset of the fourth mode. So this in MIDI sounds something like this. This is just a reduction of the passage. Okay, something like that. So here we have um, Zanakis transforming some of the harmonic materials uh, of his teacher Messia, and of course adding in uh, glissandi and creating a distinctively uh, distinctive massed sound. Another thing I noticed is that uh, these references to Messiaen's modes are not limited just to that brass passage, but rather if we take the, the boundary pitches of the opening string mass and the four note chord at the end of the second string mass and combine them, we get the same seven pitch classes. So this is a comparison of those with the seven note chord from the brass. Here's a seven note chord combining those string chords and then the brass. Okay, from the standpoint of form, we've already talked a little bit about a thematic process in the first 104 measures, which would constitute the first part of the work. The work contains four parts, so here are the, the first uh, 104 measures as the first part. Um, a similar type of process is reflected in the large scale uh, form of the piece. We have our initial ideas presented in the first part, then some linear ideas in the strings, which uh, form a contrasting element, and then a combination of those elements involving some fragmentation of the musical surface, and then finally uh, closing glissandi. And then uh, it turns out that each of these uh, uh, elements of the piece formally is structured proportionally in a somewhat similar way. Within the first part, the durations of the outer sections are equivalent to the duration of the inner sections. And within the piece as a whole, the first and last parts, their combined durations, are the golden section of the combined durations of the inner sections, the inner parts. This uh, is a graphic transcription, which probably many of you have seen uh, the sketches for over at the drawing center, of the end of the third part of Metastasis. I'm calling this a retransition because this is where the woodwinds, brass, and percussion drop out and the ensemble reverts to strings alone. You'll hear a little bit of the other instruments at the beginning of this. Okay, and of course, uh, some of the, the ruled surfaces that are used there were also applied to uh, projects like the Phillips Pavilion. There's a model of that shown there. But I was interested in particular in how Zanakis rendered those ruled surfaces into uh, musical reality, as it were. And as I began to look at some of the violin parts in detail, I noticed that in this portion, graphically, we have an A sharp, which serves as an axis of inversion around which a uh, chromatic cluster bounded by a tritone moves. And then, happening at twice that speed, below that axis of inversion, we have another chromatic cluster in violins, this time filling in a perfect fifth, and that gets inverted around the A sharp. Following that, um, we get all the instruments starting on a single note, and then they spread out to form a chromatic cluster. But what's perhaps most interesting about this is the timing um, of the instruments when they begin their parts, when they reach their destinations. And these are carefully worked out, <clears throat> excuse me, so that around this uh, axis, 
the, and sort of an arch is formed, which seems to uh, represent perhaps a portion of a, a hyperbo hyperbolic paraboloid. And here uh, we have the effect of something that looks like uh, a cone in, in a planar space. So I'm going to play this passage in MIDI at half tempo, just to make it a little bit clearer perhaps what the instruments are doing, and then I'll play it at the original tempo, if I can get my cursor to behave. Nope, that's not what I wanted to do. Here it is. Okay, now at tempo. Okay, this is a... Uh, graphic transcription of the concluding mass of string glissandi. And uh, what I found interesting here was, again, an application of um, integers from the Fibonacci series. It takes the instruments eight measures until they change direction the first time, then five for the next change of direction, then three for this section, and then the remaining 13 measures of the unison uh, are symmetrical around this this. Three measure, three measure passage here, and that sounds like this. Okay, stepping back and taking a little bit of a broader view, um, I have once again shown the boundaries of the first string <clears throat> mass, and then I have shown the beginnings of the second string mass, which leads to a four-note chord. So I'm showing the notes of the chord in open note heads. At the end of the retransition, which we saw a couple of slides ago, we end up on another four-note chord. And then this, these are the boundary uh, pitches of that final glissando mass. In looking at things this way, I noticed that uh, the pitch class E appears in each one of these uh, sections. Here is the lowest note in the basses. Also here is the lowest note in the four-note chord at the end of the first part of the piece. Here is the highest note of this four-note chord. And um, another thing I noticed is that with this first four-note chord, as Jim Harley has pointed out, there's a consonance here between the E, the G sharp, and actually all of the notes involved come from the E major scale, whereas here we've got a chromatic cluster that has been spread out over several octaves, and in the final glissando mass we get the chromatic notes as the lower boundaries, and then we get a B major triad outlined above, and then both of the, uh, the boundaries end up on G sharp, which of course is consonant with E. So this reduction sounds like this.
stepping back even farther, I considered what might happen if we reduced the, uh, the range of some of those chords and put them in a somewhat conventional voice leading situation. And I discovered that the boundaries of the first uh, um, string mass <clears throat> could form a common tone diminished seventh chord with E in the bass. And then those at the end form a, a tonic ninth chord in E major. And that together sounds like this. If I can get the mouse, here we go. Okay, so in conclusion, um, metastasis represents a synthesis of musical developments that um, from, from the time sort of the generation before Xenakis and even uh, further back than that. And also, of course, of developments in drawing and architecture that were current or well-established at that time, as well as a reflection of his personal experiences in Greece in the 1940s. And there actually is a beautiful quote in the, uh, uh, the, in the book of interviews with Varga that I had included, but I cut it for reasons of time. And in terms of analysis of the music, uh, there are aspects of Xenakis' music clearly that are complex, abstract, and musically atypical of his predecessor's contemporaries. But there are also clear structural signposts in the music. Um, and I delve into some of the harmonic signposts here. And also, of course, the use of temporal proportioning seems to me to give the music structural depth and to guide the listener through perhaps the unfamiliar territory of Xenakis' music. Thank you.